All right, maybe I'll do the quick introductions and get the process started. So first off, it's a great pleasure to have people both in person for a long time. We haven't been able to do that. And also online, so we're doing it hybrid now, which is good. Um, so if you have questions either in the room or if you're doing it remotely, feel free to kind of call in or chat or whatever. If you're here in person, you have the pleasure of having cookies, which Jim insisted that we do both cookies and coffee for we're going to do this in person. We're going to do it right. <laughs> so he's like, we have to do it. So he's, a, he's away this week, but just he'll be happy that we actually did that. Okay, so with all those little like uh, side issues out of the way, let me start the actual part of the talk, which is my great pleasure to introduce our one of our newest faculty here, Max Lee. He's an assistant professor in aerospace engineering. He recently got his PhD from MIT. He did a postdoc, I think, at MITRE for roughly a year. Uh, he just started in August, so this is kind of his chance to introduce himself to the community here at Michigan. Um, he's in, doing some great research in air transportation, network systems, controls, and optimization, and he's won already a few awards. He, you know, he won a fellowship as a graduate student. He also won some best paper awards. One was, I guess, at one of the conferences on air transportation. So very distinguished already. Without any, any further ado, I'll let you kind of get started. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for the uh, very kind introduction. Um, thank you all for joining me on a Friday afternoon. I'll try to I'll try to make this um, entertaining, and hopefully, you'll walk away here at least learning something that'll help you in your air travels, um, if nothing else. So, uh, I you know to give a brief structure of what I wanted to go through today. So, first. Uh, this system is kind of nebulous to all of us, right? When it's working well, you get on your plane to go visit your family, to go uh, do business, and you really don't think about what's running in the background, right? So I definitely wanted to start out with just the background of what's really behind getting you from point A to point B in this system safely and efficiently. Um, then I'll kind of walk through three research, um, you know, vignettes in terms of how do we identify disruptions in this complex system? How do we predict what, you know, how this disruption is evolving through time? And then finally, um, and sorry for kind of this top heavy half, but uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what things we can do to actually uh, reschedule, get things back on track and control the system in a, um, in a way that we desire. So, and if there's time, um, I will talk about some very, very recent and ongoing work to actually, how would you implement this in real life, right? Which is a lot trickier than, than doing it in simulation. So with that, starting off with some background. So a horrible day in SFO, I think this was uh, a couple months ago. Uh, what you see here is just a screenshot I grabbed from FlightAware. There are uh, uh, arriving flights in blue, departing flights in green. Uh, there's some pretty nasty weather happening at San Francisco at this moment. So you see some uh, uh, airplanes that are already on their way having to do some airborne holding, right, which is pretty unusual in the US actually. Um, and then uh, elsewhere in the system, they have been throttled. So in terms of not being released at their destination, uh, at their origin airports. Um, you as a passenger sees this in the FAA. This is kind of the situation that, thank you. This is kind of the situation that they are looking at. So basically SFO is having a lot of go arounds. That's when you almost land, but then you actually, because of weather conditions, visibility issues, you actually kind of fly up again to wait for better conditions. Um, and the reason here is this low, uh, low ceiling. So the cloud layers are really low. It's really hard to see what's going on. So it's, it's very dangerous to land. Um, and in fact, to give you a sneak preview of why this is kind of a weirdly complicated multi-stakeholder problem is uh, you have centralized controllers like the Federal Aviation Administration, the air traffic controls, but also airlines have a stake in this, right? So airlines can actually, uh, uh, you know, say, well, things are, you know, hitting the fans at SFO to protect my own schedule and my own operations, I'm going to issue what's called a ground stop. And what a ground stop really is, is if you're flying Detroit to SFO and SFO is under a ground stop, you are frozen in place at Detroit. You, you're not allowed to take off to, to SFO. And you'll see these notions of metering, of throttling, of, of rate reductions throughout this talk as I talk about some of the control actions that we can, that, that, that we can implement to uh, you know, manage disruptions. 
And you can actually, so this is actually all public. So if you go to this URL, you can see all the real time information. This updates much faster than your air, airport gate information. So if you ever wanted to get the real lowdown of what's going on, you can literally just click that link. It's a little user unfriendly in terms of the text, but um, you can. Uh, so to really drive home this point of this being a pretty multi-stakeholder problem, uh, what, what are the entities involved in deciding whether or not this network is under disruption or there's a need to implement some sort of control action because we don't have sufficient capacity given our demands? Well, so maybe the most obvious one is a uh, stakeholder is the Federal Aviation Administration and their associated air traffic controllers. Another stakeholder, of course, are the airlines, as I've mentioned. Um, another stakeholder that people don't think about as often is actually military. Right, so military has a, a, a airspace usage um, a, as well. So uh, they are involved in this um, in this collaborative decision making process. And then finally, we you know we have northern and southern neighbors, right? So international um, air navigation service providers, essentially the uh, Canadian and, and uh, Mexican version of the Federal Aviation Administration. They are also involved in this collaborative decision uh, decision making process. So with that. This is sort of how the pipeline looks simplified. So you have some very, very uh, initial inputs. These like, plans and schedules are, 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 big, are created months in advance. And then uh, you know, a couple hours before operations, you might update your flight plans. That is uh, uh, you know, taken into account when we think about what is the current capacities, what are the current arrival and departure rates at my airport. Uh, that gets chugged in into this big nebulous system. And then what we observe in terms of performance measures, right, we observe delays at, at certain nodes in the system, for example, at the airports. And so delays, uh, I'll kind of breeze through this slide a bit fast, but delays cost money <laughs> at the end of the day. They also have environmental impacts in terms of additional emissions. Um, uh, because you are, you know, you need to reroute, or you have airport holding, or you're kind of spending time idling on the ground. So it is quite costly. And these are actually a little outdated. This is a number for 2019. 2020 and 2021, you might expect delays were not as one of an issue because of COVID. But now delays are back in with a vengeance, right? Compounded by airline workforce issues. So I uh, obviously, I can't give you 2022 numbers because we're still in the middle of 2022. But once uh, 2022 numbers come out, I expect them to be worse than, than 2019. Um, and uh, to zoom in on one piece of this, so the environmental piece, um, what, what kind of motivates a lot of the research that I do, you know, trying to eke out little improvements in this air traffic management system is that the, a, a majority of your emissions, actually uh, about a third of your emissions are kind of disproportionately attributed to flights that are in this, you know, domestic uh, uh, range, right, 1,500 kilometers, about the distance from Boston to O'Hare. I should update that with a Detroit example, but uh, basically, these short to medium range flights account for a lot of the emissions. So, if you were to be able to improve air traffic management initiatives, which happen to also mostly affect these short to medium haul flights, you can get some disproportionate improvements, right, in terms of, for example, emissions. So with that, you know, let's, if we think about this pipeline, right, we're looking at this output in terms of the measures, right? We were like, okay, this was at, uh, you know, 9 a.m. And then this was at 10 a.m. And this was at 11 a.m. And 12 p.m. What might be some of the questions we may want to ask? Well, the first is, how do we know, how do we identify when there is something going on, when there's an issue happening in my airspace? Another question, once we have identification, is what might happen next, right? Uh, what might happen at our T plus one. And then finally, uh, the, 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 uh, the last question we might want to ask is, well, do we want that to happen, right? Do we, would we rather have the airspace do something else, right? Would we, would we rather see the system behave in another way? And if so, what's the cost of, of trying to drive it to this other uh, more, de hopefully more desirable state, right? So that's, this kind of uh, also gives you the pieces of what I will We'll, we'll go through uh, during today's presentation, starting with the identification portion. So before I move on, I definitely want to acknowledge all of my collaborators without whom these uh, uh, series of projects would not be possible. Uh, 
a couple of my colleagues back at, back at MIT, as well as some collaborators at the U of I and Texas A&M, um, as well as Karthik, who is now um, a postdoc at, at uh, Stanford. So moving on to the second piece, um, let's, so uh, let me just set, uh, let me set up the kind of the couple of performance measures that, that we'll use to do this identification, right? So let's consider just, if I gave you the time series of let's say the delays at uh, uh, Boston and Philly at these two East Coast airports, um, one thing you might notice is, okay, well, when Philly has pretty low delays, Boston has pretty low delays. Um, and when Philly has high delays, Boston has high delays, right? Why might this be? Well, there's a lot of traffic interlinking these two airports. So if a flight departs Philly delayed, assuming it doesn't like teleport midair, it's probably gonna land in Boston delayed, right? Uh, furthermore, if a weather system impacts Philly, there's a good chance that it'll, it'll, that it'll impact Boston, right? Maybe with some time delay, but it'll, uh, there's a good chance it'll be affected by the same system, right? Uh, of course, you know, formally, we could say that the delay time series here have, have pretty high positive correlations, right? So keeping this in mind, what if, if, let me set up these two scenarios for you. Okay, let me, let, suppose one day I hand you a situation, you're the air traffic controller, and I say, all right, on one day, the delays are 90 minutes at both Philly and Boston, and on another day, the delays are 170 minutes in, in Philly and 10 minutes in Boston, right? Um, and I say, what's the, what's the impact on, on my system? Let's pretend this is the only two airports in, in my system that I care about. Well, one measure that you might use and that people do currently use is just a measure of the total delay in my system, right? Which is 180 minutes. You just sum up the delays at all your airports. But immediately, something should strike you as kind of weird about this right-hand side situation, right? You're like, well, historically, because of all these interlinking factors, whether it's shared traffic, et cetera, um, I know that these delays should be pretty highly positively correlated, but for some reason, there's, you know, uh, on this particular day, there's really heavy delays out of Philly, but Boston is doing fine, right? And this total delay measure really doesn't tell you, um, yeah, it really doesn't differentiate between these two situations, right? So now, you know, this, you, know, you could be like, hey, this is, this is kind of dumb. I can just point out like, okay, 170, 10, right? That's the one that has the issue, but what if, what if I scale this up to the entire network? Right. So these are two real days from 2014 and 2016 that essentially have, you know, the same total delays across my system. Um, but what I'm plotting here is the magnitude of delays at my other at my other nodes. And the bigger the circle and the redder the circle, the more delays there are. So obviously the total delays are about the same, but the spatial distribution of them are very different. Right. And again, the total delay measure is not going to capture that. And why is this important to differentiate? Well, uh, flat. Do you uh, do y'all remember what I talked about with that ground stop happening in San Francisco? Uh, you can think of ground delay programs as sort of a uh, a, a, a a ground stop light addition. Um, so it, we also plotted kind of the the traffic management initiatives that were executed for both of these days, and they're obviously very different policies right, between this day and this day, just given their different spatial distribution. So how do we, how do we kind of rigorously identify this difference? Um, well, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna slap a metric in your face and then <laughs> we'll go through that metric and, and, and sort of see why it's, 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 it's a nice measure to use. But first, some quick notation. So I'm gonna use X of I to be the delays at airport I, um, of which, of course, this X of I is gonna be a non-negative number, right? Uh, and when the R, uh, RIJ is going to be the correlation between airports I and J, given their historical um, uh, delay time series. Um, there's this notion called the total variation across the graph, um, not to be confused with total variations for like probability measures or distribution. So it's, it's, it's a little annoying that it's the kind of the same term, but the total variation across a network is computed as the following um, it is, 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 is computed as the following uh, uh, um, sum. So what you're going to do is you're going to look at all of the unique pairs of airports, I, comma, J. You're going to take their difference in the delay. You're going to square it and modulate it by its, uh, uh, um, by its correlation coefficient. You can also write this in a quadratic form, right? So if you stack all my delays in a vector and you write this as X transpose a matrix X, that matrix is, is related to the adjacency matrix of the underlying graph, if the underlying graph was the correlation um, uh, uh, network. But I, I kind of like it seeing written out in this way because I think it's more intuitive in terms of why it 
satisfies uh, 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 what we're trying to do here. So, uh, you know, before I kind of motivate this metric, we can just first of all calculate all the correlations, right? So we take all the delay time series uh, uh, for, for the top 30 airports in the US and we compute their correlation coefficient. The darker the red squares, the higher, the closer you are to a correlation of one in this. And I also plotted it geographically just, just for funsies. Um, so why is this the metric we want? Well, let's let's take a look at an example with low correlation. So say San Francisco and Miami, not that much shared traffic. They're also very geographically far apart. So historically, their correlation is quite close to zero. So this 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 R this R value is very close to zero. And now what this is almost saying is I don't really care what the differential. What, uh, 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 what the difference is between the delays at SFO and Miami, because historically I don't expect them to really correlate that much with each other. So the contribution of the SFO comma MIA term to this total variation is going to be very small, right? Because because it's going to be uh, 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 multiplied here by a thing that's very close to zero. Right? On the other hand, if we go back to that boss Philly case, so now you're you're much closer to one, right? Your your RIJ value is much closer to one, so. What is going to happen to the contribution of this of this term to the total variation? Well, if I if I go back to our little toy example and I just think about how this would be measured in in terms of its contributions to the TV, of course, when the delays are 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 are, are similar, right? This term is going to be zero, um, and if, uh, and you can also think of issues where. Well, what if Boston has a lot more traffic? You can always scale it by the traffic first before computing this. And in fact, we usually look at average delays. So we don't bias any airports because they're busier or, or less busy. Um, on the other hand, if you have this right-hand side situation, right, this is going to give you a huge number because you're going to get a large number from this difference, squared difference, and you're going to multiply by something that's not really zero anymore. So we can go back to this uh, uh, real life case and compute the total variation, right? And we'll see that the total variation for this day is much higher than the total vari variation for this day. And um, if any one of you are, are Delta airline fans, you might uh, immediately see that uh, there is something going on in Delta's network where the delays are really propagating from its hub in Atlanta to Detroit, to uh, uh, Minneapolis, Salt Lake City, Los Angeles. Um, so this results in a distribution of signal that's actually smoother, right? It, it's high, but it's high throughout my network, which is why the total variation is going to be lower because it's a smoother signal across my graph. On the other hand, this day, the, the delays are really kind of coagulated at New York, right? But again, since New York is an East Coast airport, it actually looks like the other East Coast airports are doing okay in this case. So you have this really weird differential, right? And that's being picked up by this total variation metric. Okay, so with that, what we can actually do is we can say, okay, given a day of delay distributed across my network, I can I can kind of plot, I can think about this projection right into into uh, a total delay measure. So how much delay are there in my system? What's the what's the magnitude of the impact? And also, what's the spatial distribution? Right, where is it, are my delays kind of like uh, stuffed up in at one node, or is it sort of uh, a distributed? Uh, Across, across my network. And of course, there's, you know, this corner should strike you as like being kind of nice, right? This is the corner where you have low delays, right? There's not much going on. And it's also distributed uh, uh, in, you know, across my graph in sort of an expected manner. So what we did then was we said, okay, traditionally air traffic controllers care about this metric, this blue line. What is that blue line? It's just the met, it's just some percentile, right? It's saying, Usually, if I, if my total delay is higher than this, my system is disrupted. If it's lower than this, my system is working fine. But that may not be the case, right? You could actually have cases where the delay is maybe not too high. It's a medium delay kind of day. But because they're distributed in my network in such a weird way, that might cause issues in terms of how do you recover from that kind of disruptive situation, right? So what we did is, and I'm hiding some of the, uh, I'm hiding some of the math here. I have, I'm happy to refer you to, to the papers we're talking offline, but we came up with some ways to actually uh, essentially uh, uh, draw kind of um, outlier detecting bounds for uh, what it means to have really high or really low total variation. And you can think about partitioning this space of total delay and total variation into four separate, uh, into these four regions. And I'm gonna go through some uh, uh, hourly 
actual examples from American Airlines Network of, of, um, uh, of uh, uh, instances of each of these regions. So the first region, I think, was that, it, again, it's that smiley face green region that we wanted to be in, right? So the first region here, it's characterized by low total delay. So the delays are pretty low. And it's kind of distributed nicely. And uh, this is a pretty boring picture, but this is what American likes to see, right? Very low delays across my entire network. Right. There's really, you can't see anything because there's no delays at, at any of the airports. So that's kind of region one, right? Region two is sort of those days where the delays are super high, but they're sort of evenly spread out throughout my network, right? So here's a day for American uh, uh, where, um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, things are, you know, hitting the fans, but they're kind of hitting the fans everywhere in, in the network. Um, we can also think about this region three, right? So. If you squint your eyes and ignore uh, DC in this case, you would say this is a pretty good day for America, right? Most of their, their network is, is doing okay, but because you have this really spiky high signal in DC, uh, uh, you actually will probably end up somewhere in this region where you have medium levels of delay, but the spatial distribution is sort of wacky. And then finally, the last region is kind of, you know, maybe worst of both worlds, right? So in this case, you actually see this is a particularly bad uh, uh, day of hour for, for American Airlines, where there is high delay throughout my network, right? But there's in uh, there's some particular issues going on in Seattle in this case, right? So this was actually this was actually uh, uh, classified in, in um, this this fourth region here. So now I've been hiding the element of time a bit, right? I've been sort of giving you snapshots, but of course we can think about a moving timeline, right? Of of you know t t plus one t plus two and so on. And we can actually, we can go ahead and plot this, uh, you know, in this projection, which gives the spatial distribution and magnitude characteristics. And we can think about looking at these trajectory type objects in this space, right? We can think about in a given sequence of hours or 15 minute intervals or days, depending on what discretization you're interested in, right? What, 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 what does the trajectory of how my system is doing look like in this space? And now we, were, we, we did a lot of fun things with this, right? So we took this object and we said, well, we can go ahead and cluster it, right? We can cluster uh, DRT, oh, I should really explain what DRTs are, disruption recovery trajectories, right? So essentially your system is disrupted, then it recovers, right? So we call these DRTs. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll probably use trajectories and DRTs kind of interchangeably, so apologies beforehand. Um, but we did kind of three separate things to them. We, first of all, we clustered them, right? So we wanted to look at disruptions across uh, uh, you know, a period of time that looked like each other, right? What kind of disruptions, uh, 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 you know, have the same sort of characteristics so that we can deal with them in the same way, right? Uh, we also looked at predictions. So, you know, if, uh, suppose you're looking at a DRT in real time and you wanted to predict its evolution in this space, right? Uh, how, how might you uh, do that kind of prediction? And then finally, we built some hierarchical models, which says this is, you can think of this as almost like a high, like a high level desire of how you want the system to evolve, right? I want the system to evolve in a way that the spatial distribution is of a certain characteristic and so on. But what this doesn't tell you is what's the underlying system generating the signal? Well, it's airlines with schedules running their flights, right? That's, what's, that's what underlying is generating these signals. So we built hierarchical control models where uh, you can actually specify what you would like the system to evolve in and you pass that down to a lower level controller, which is actually a rescheduling optimization problem. Um, and, and of course, uh, you, should, you should already suspect that if you ask for something too um, crazy, it might not give you a schedule for that, right? So there are some limitations on what the low level controller could actually give you back in terms of your high level specifications. But I'll go, th so I'll go through uh, uh, each of these starting with the clustering. So what we did was we wanted to find features, right? To cluster you first need features, we wanted to find some features of interest on these DRT objects that we would we, that we wanted to cluster them with. Um, so the first one we used was just length, right? So how long was your disruption recovery sequence, right? How many, in this case, we use hour-based discretization. So uh, for example, this is a 12 hour or a 12, uh, uh, a length 12, DRT. So this is one of the features we used in clustering. So this gives you a sense of how long did it take your system to um, get thrown out of whack and then recover again. Um, another feature we used was, remember that this space is actually uh, uh, kind of chopped up in this way, right? So uh, of course, each of the points here belong to one of the four regions. 
and you can count the number of, uh, of, of belongings of each point in each region, right? So this is also a set of features we use because this gives you an idea of, you know, how long were you in region four, which was the high delay, high total variation region and so on, right? So we collected this as a set of features as well. Uh, some other features we use, maximum, uh, 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 basically the worst that, that occurred throughout the entire length of the CRT. Um, as well as this kind of uh, kind of funky one that we call the signed enclosed area, and how we we how we computed this was we essentially uh, looked at the uh, the area you know using some trapezoidal approximations of what is enclosed by uh, uh, actually they, they aren't approximations they're actually the exact areas of what's, of what's enclosed by um, any loops that exist in this uh, in this trajectory. Why might we want to look at something like a signed enclosed area? Well, if you have a DRT that's comprised of a lot of negative areas, what that tells you is on average, the total variation, so the spatial distribution was more unexpected during the recovery phase, right? When, and of course you have to first assign a little sign convention, right? If you assign it and stick with that convention, then what a negative area in this convention tells you is that when you're recovering in terms of total delay, the recovery happens in, in, in unexpected spatial uh, uh, distributions across my graph, right? Um, on the other hand, a positive area tells you that uh, the, the, the total variation was higher during the disruption phase, right? When the delays were actually actively increasing, um, uh, 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 how does the um, spatial distribution of these, uh, of these delays look, look on, my, on top of my graph? So, we use these two features as well. Yes. 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 What characterizes the start and the end of one of these trajectories? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so most of the time, your system is living in this one region, right? What so how we denote a start is when it exits the one region. So when it exits, that's the beginning of a DRT, and then when it comes back in, that's the end, right? Sorry, I should have mentioned that. That's also sort of what the color coding is here, but anyways. And you also feel, yeah, feel free to interrupt me if I, yes. A question for the uh, four region, like why region three and region four, they have two disjoint parts. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's also a great question. Um, so what, so here you can almost think of these as like times when the, the total variation is abnormally low given the delays, right? So if you, if you look at how we wrote TV, it's a quadratic form on the delays, right? So you do expect if I have high delays, my TV should be naturally higher, which is why these bounds are curved, right? Because uh, it, it's, it's a quadratic function. Uh, it's, it's quadratic on, on the delay magnitudes, right? So it's also of interest if you have really high delays, but it's like abnormally smooth is that's what these three and four regions are. You, what you actually see is that depending on the hour, these bounds change. And for some of the hours with low delays, these two regions actually disappear. So that lower bound actually collapses to the axis. So it actually changes depending on, um, uh, on the hour of day. But yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the pot. Yeah. So the positive and negative areas. Um, what well, what we did was we 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 said anything. So if I look at each segment, I can compute an area using like using this trapezoid, right? So we said if it's going, uh, 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 if it's going, um, if if like the total delay is lower than what it was at the other end, we assigned um, a a positive value to it. And then if it's going the other way, then that trapezoid gives you a negative area. And then if you sum it up across every one of your segments, if you get a more negative or more positive thing, you'll get like, oh, it was primarily dominated by a counterclockwise loop or primarily dominated by a clockwise loop, right? You can flip all, you, so you can flip your, your sign conventions too. It's just that then these uh, interpretations gets flipped too appropriately. Um, so I'll, I'll oops. Sorry. Okay, I'll go a little bit faster so I can get to the uh, get to some of the, the later stuff. But basically, we um, to make a long story short, we were able to find these really interesting clusters of DRTs that actually mapped to different types of disruption. So, for example, you had uh, really short-term spurts 
where your system was disrupted and then recovered very rapidly. Um, and then you had disruptions that mapped to kind of uh, uh, large chunks of your operating day, right? And um, we have, and then you have kind of right, truly monstrous DRTs. And these were of a lot of interest to um, the air traffic management folks because it's been usually your system recovers at night, right? Because you're, you're, you know, not that many people are flying, the demand is, goes down, but multi-day DRTs, right? They're 55 hours on average, right? These are two to three day long DRTs. So this tells you that the system was unable to recover even during the usual periods that it was supposed to recover, right? So these, these, uh, these were of particular operational interest for folks to, to, to think about. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll also refer you to the paper. I won't cover these in, in, uh, for, for time, but we also split them. We, you know, we looked at some typical disruptions, hurricanes, thunderstorms, uh, 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 airport outages, um, uh, and uh, large blizzard systems, nor'easters. And we looked at what, uh, what prevalence of these DRT types were, uh, what, were the, what was the prevalence of these DRT types across these different types of disruptions. So we, we, we did those uh, uh, categorizations as well. So uh, for the prediction part, uh, remember the story is, suppose you're looking at a real-time DRT, right? And you want to find out what is going to be the, the, the evolution of this in the next hour. So how we approach this was we, we, we said, okay, what do we know? Well, at the current time, right? Suppose that's where you currently are in, in, the, in the system in terms of your, your total delay, uh, which is really just the one norm of your, if, if X is the vector, right? It's the one norm of your vector um, and, 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 and the total variation. So at the current time, you have full knowledge of everything, right? You know what's going on at your airports in terms of its delays, you know its capacities, and you also know the ambient weather, right? Of course, you also know what happened at, you know, maybe the last hour or the hour before that, right? So you have some, some history that you can, that you can uh, um, base things off of. So now the question is, okay, let's suppose you want to you wanna predict at the next hour, is my total delay going to increase or decrease? Or is my total variation going to increase or decrease, right? So what's the trend of this DRT in the next hour? Um, and another... Uh, uh, Another interesting prediction that you might want to know is what angle is this going to move in, in the next hour, right? So, uh, uh, so trying to predict this this uh, um, this angle here, we actually just used a. I think we just mapped them to the four quadrants. You'll you'll see them. You'll see it later on. But uh, of course, if you move in this direction, that's telling you something interesting about the fact that your system is going to recover, but it's going to recover with spatial impacts. Right. Whereas if you move in like uh, this direction, let's say, then you're kind of recovering on both of these measures. Right? So what we did was for uh, uh, how we built this prediction um, was we said, OK, for if you tell me that that's where we are right now, I'm going to look back in, you know, how, however much data I have. Right. And I'm going to find all of the uh, 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 previous hours that are close neighbors of this hour. Right. So these are all previous hours that were close neighbors, but for these other, for these neighboring hours, I know what direction they moved in, right, because they're historically occurred. So maybe uh, this close neighbor here in the next hour, it moved this way, right? So it has some, uh, uh, we, we know sort of what was the historical movement. And then we can, of course, scale the influence, right? So the assumption here is that if you're closer to my current state, then maybe you have a bigger influence on which way I, I'm going to in the next hour, right? So we kind of scaled it inversely, uh, uh, inversely proportional to the distance uh, between between the current hour and the, the, um, the neighbors here, right? So we did this inverse scaling, and then we essentially threw this into a kernel density estimator to estimate the the the, the kind of the uh, uh, probability contours, right? What what is the probability distribution of where I am going to be in the next time step? So that's what's represented by this contour here. And then of course, if we take the appropriate integrals, right, and we compare which, which, um, which mass, uh, what mass of the distribution is larger, then we say, okay, well, our, our, our binary prediction for total delay, let's say, in this case, in this, uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, uh, notional representation is that the total delay is gonna increase in the next hour. And we can do the exact same thing for total variation. Right? So we take the appropriate um, 
integrals and we compare the areas and we make a binary prediction based off of which one has the larger mass. Uh, oh, so yeah, so the, the, these are the quadrants. So instead of predicting like a real number for the, for, for the angle, what we did was we said, okay, it's actually uh, uh, more important for us to know the overall trend of what my system is doing. So um, same thing, you divide up this probability into the appropriate um, quadrants and then you look for whichever quadrant has the, the largest mass associated with it. So we ran this for, oh, sorry. We ran this for the, the, the four airlines and compared it to a naive baseline of just guessing based on majority, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the majority of what happened in the next hour. And um, we were able to get some good results, but we weren't completely satisfied. We we're like, this is a really interpretable predictive model, but we were wondering if we can get some better predictive accuracy, right? So uh, basically we did this across the four airlines and the black, the solid black line here is the, uh, is the binary total delay prediction. Uh, so we do beat the baseline except for some really wacky cases that I can talk offline about about Southwest. They do operate kind of a different network and different scheduling characteristics. And you'll actually see some of the uh, 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 issues with Southwest kind of persisting. Um, but, you know, we, we said, okay, well, can, can we, can, you know, we're already at the stage. Can we do a little bit better? We try to throw this into an LSTM. And we said, can we actually, instead of predicting trends, right, predicting if you're going to increase or decrease uh, or which, which quadrant you're going to move in, can I actually predict which region you're going to be in in the next, uh, uh, in the next hour? So uh, we use a very, you know, a very standard, very simple um, uh, recurrent neural network architecture. Um, and we wanted to do this prediction for T plus one, right? At the T plus one time, what is the region that, that, um, that you're going to be in? Um, and we actually, so this is the, the oh, sorry. So this is the results for T plus one. We actually have updated results for looking three hours ahead because we got some feedback from air traffic controllers that said, I, you know, one hour is not enough for me. I need to, I need more time to plan. So we actually did this again, but for the three hour look ahead window. And of course you expect uh, 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 degraded per, uh, per, uh, predictive performance, right? That's what we do see, but I don't think, I don't think I have the three hour. Yeah, okay. I don't have the three hour one yet, but yeah. Can you expand What's that stand for? Oh yeah, sorry. It's, it stands for uh, long short term memory. It's like a part, it's like a particular neural network architecture. And um, yeah, so again, we didn't do anything fancy in terms of the architecture here. It's a very standard um, recurrent neural network setup. Sorry, I should just slap acronyms in like this. Um, okay, so cool. Now we know sort of at the next time step where my system might evolve. Now the question is, what can we do, right, to to actually try to uh, uh, to, to try to um, optimize and control things in the system. So uh, I want to talk about this last part in the next you know, 10, 15 minutes and leave some time for questions. Um, basically, what, you know, if we step back a little bit, what are the various pieces? What are the various characteristics of the system, right? Well, uh, you know, we have uh, the demand side, the people who want to be served. So these are the schedules, right, that the airlines want to run. We have capacity side. So how much, how, how many planes can my airport handle uh, at, at any given time? And then we have some uh, we have some ways of of, of uh, throttling the demand side to match the capacity side, right? So these are through again the ground delay programs that you've seen, the ground stops, um, and, and some of these are essentially um, in route uh, volume control tech, uh, techniques as well. So it's so uh, in terms of the scheduling. So in terms of uh, uh, the scheduling problem, these are quite well studied since the since the late 1990s, right? So uh, these often are, are essentially giant integer programs of, uh, you know, uh, where you want to reassign people to a new departure time to, to lower the amount of uh, uh, cost that, that you incur, right? So these are, these are very well-studied problems. What we wanted to do is we wanted to couple these problems with that higher level model that we talked about for the last 40 minutes, which is, do I want my system to to, to, to recover by shunting the delay into one part of the system, so higher total variation, or do I want it to recover by spreading out the pain amongst more airports, right? So do I want it to recover with a lower total variation? And either, I try, I try my best to not say high total variation is bad, right? Because depending on the situation, you might actually want to recover in one way versus another, right? You could say 
well, New York LaGuardia is out of control, try to shove it all in there, protect the rest of my system, right, <laughs> from, from impact. On other days, you might say, well, let me, let me distribute the impacts a little bit, right? So it, 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 it depends. And there are some interesting questions of like equity between airlines here as well, right? So how do you make sure all of your control policies aren't just shunting delays only towards Atlanta, in which case Delta would not be happy about that, right? Okay, so, so essentially uh, why this is now relevant now in, in 2022 is because FAA has established this ginormous data backbone. It's called the SWIM backbone, and you can actually tap into it yourself um, if, if, you, if you have some uh, programming and API knowledge, the, tapping into this backbone will give you real-time information on airport capacities, on current flight times, estimated departure times. Basically, like it's, a, it's, it's, it's just a giant feed of what's going on currently in the national airspace. Um, and a lot, of, uh, 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 and, and, um, a lot of airlines have taps into the SWIM feed. So with, with these initiatives, you can now think of actually, you know, uh, uh, building this sort of more closed loop system where you have kind of this real time monitoring ability of what the health is of your system at any time and then, and then potentially do a better job of doing this low level rescheduling of the, of the flights uh, within your airlines. Right? So what this process sort of looks like is, again, as I mentioned, this low level controller is running a problem like the multi airport ground holding problem or the MAGIP, horrible acronym. But if you hear me say MAGIP, this is what I'm referring to. And what this is, is it's essentially a way to assign the ground stops. So remember, remember ground stops is you hold an airport at the origin so that they don't take off so that you don't get issues with airport holding, right? So this is sort of the optimization problem between uh, behind. Uh, establishing a ground stop or a ground delay program. So this is sort of the low level controller, right? If we, if we think of it as a scheduling action, right? If I tweak my schedule and you know, you're gonna run the schedule, the system's gonna operate and what you're gonna, what, again, what we, what we observe are the delays, right? Let's say the delays at my airports. Um, what would the FAA or what would the air traffic controllers like? Well, they would like some sort of a, um, you know, what, what they would like to do is to say, I want to protect Atlanta from further delays, or I want to protect the Northeast from further delays, or um, I, you know, something is going to happen on the West Coast, I would like to, um, I would like to establish the correct traffic management initiatives to protect the West Coast, right? So um, what, what, what they would like to do is actually influence this evolution directly, but that's not possible, right? You need to uh, what's because what's actually driving the delays you observe is this you running the schedule and you know demand going over capacity or something right so this is what we'd like to do this is what we have to this is what actually happens in real life right so how do we actually try to couple um uh, these these two levels together right so this is what i'm going to start calling the high level planner and then this down here is what i'm going to start calling the low level controller um so recall from this representation, right? So you, you have a notion of when, whenever the system is disrupted and then the system recovers back into the into, into region one. You, so this is just the good old DRTs that we had saw um, earlier in the lecture. Um, so what we did was, and this was, this was back in a 2020 CDC paper, is we came up with a way to actually uh, propose new trajectories. Uh, so if this, if this blue trajectory is how you would have evolved, given a multi-airport ground holding problem that you ran at you know, some initial time, you have a, you know, perhaps you want to, again, redistribute delays away from the New York airports. So let's say that's your high level objective, right? So what this high level planner will do is it will propose a new trajectory. It'll propose a new system trajectory. In this case, I guess this trajectory um, uh, 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 gives you lower total variation throughout the length of the disruption. But notice that what we assume here is that we assume delay is conserved, right? So we, we, we are gonna give ourselves the luxury of allowing delays to slip out of the system. Of course, there is a way to build in that sink and it's through cancellations, right? But we, we uh, by canceling a flight. So we didn't build in that, that sink, but that is something that is part of ongoing work. So in this case, delay is conserved. So you, so for every one of these uh, points in the new trajectory, they should have about, they have about the same total delay. I think we gave it a little buffer 
zone in there, but they have the same total delay as the previous old trajectories. So given this new trajectory, what we would like, oh, sorry, yeah, so this is the key, idea, my bad, this is the key idea behind the high-level planner, right? So the high-level planner, it goes over the distribution of my delays, right? It doesn't touch the schedule at all, right? It has no idea of what the actual schedules the airlines are running, right? Um, and it tries to provide, um, it tries to accommodate for objectives like, you know, reduce delays at New York or reduce delays at Delta hubs or something, right? Depending on whatever objective you're trying to run. So, it, and, and then it proposes a new plan, which I'm gonna start calling the reference plan. And this reference plan is, is, is a plan for how the delays I would like, how I would like the delays to evolve at every single time, at, at, at every time interval. Yeah, so old plan, reference plan, right in the room. And uh, yeah, so just going, stepping through some notation here. Yeah, so again, we're not happy with how the delays were evolving in the old trajectories. We come up with this new trajectory and we, again, what's, what's really problematic about this new trajectory is that it has no idea of what schedule will actually give you in a delay evolution that's close to what you would like in this red trajectory here. Right? So what we need to do is we need to actually now couple this into the multi-airport ground holding problem, right? This, this lower level problem. So what we did was we came up with three different formulations of this MAGIP problem. So the baseline MAGIP is just uh, if you had run if you had run your schedule without accounting for the high level plan, right? And then we have a couple of other comparisons where this redistribution you can think of it as a naive way to to accomplish certain goals like protecting certain airports. And all that this naive plan does is it stuffs a new constraint into the maggot that says the delays at New York cannot be greater than some, than, than, than some cap. So we wanted to compare this naive approach to this augmented maggot, where the augmented maggot actually incorporates that reference plan. And I'll step through how the reference plan is incorporated. So again, remember, maggots is the way that you, uh, oh, sorry, it's the way that you, um, you uh, compute how much minutes of delay I should assign to each flight during a ground stop or during a ground delay program. So what are the constraints in my maggot? Um, I, I'll, I'll, you, don't, you don't have to get lost in the notation. I'll just kind of highlight what these constraints mean. So the constraints in the maggot are as follows. So of course, given uh, you have departure capacities at your airports, right? You can't exceed these departure capacities uh, in, in the new schedule, right? So you have departure and arrival capacities at airports. Um, you have feasible arrival and departure times one aircraft isn't just flying one flight. There's connections as well, right? You can't, uh, 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 you, you know, you can't delay someone so so much that they miss their other connections, right? In terms of that, in terms of that aircraft. So there's also um, kind of an interval of time that each flight can actually depart and uh, uh, arrive in, right? So we 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 uh, we set that constraint as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, you can't teleport from one airport to another in an unrealistic time, right? So we have some minimal travel time constraint in there uh, as well. So that um, uh, basically a, a reality check constraint, right? And the object, so the objective variables, uh, the decision variables here are, are binary. They're one and zero decisions of whether or not you choose to depart at a particular time. So that's what the baseline maggot looks like, right? So the baseline maggot is trying to minimize its objective, which is total delay cost. And it's the cost of you delaying someone on the ground plus someone uh, getting to your airport, having no capacity to land and having to hold, right? So uh, of course, uh, uh, in all maggot instantiations, the constant associated, uh, the constant multiplier associated with this cost is much greater than the constant associated with the ground delay cost, right? Um, and again, in the redistribution maggot, we literally just stuff in a couple extra constraints that says at the airports that I want to protect, I'm going to penalize you more if you have delays at those airports. Um, for the augmented maggot, the constraint that we implement here is uh, re re remember that reference plan that we had. So what it's going to do is it's going to penalize you if you deviate away from that reference plan. So I'm not gonna dictate how exactly you choose to reschedule or, 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 or delay flights and so on, but I am gonna penalize you if the resultant delay across the network from a schedule is 
significantly far from my reference plan trajectory. So I know I'm running a little long time, so I'll try to go through this a little fast. Um, we tested this on a real set of flights um, uh, of about of just a little under 10,000 flights from the core 30 airports. Um, and also, these are all public data sets, so you can feel free to go and explore these on your own as well. Um, we looked at six disruption scenarios. I'm just going to show you results from one of them. So this is what we call the American Airlines disruptive scenario. Uh, what we had was we, we artificially reduced the capacity at these five airports, so all large American airline hubs. And we, we, we gave the scheduler a task of protecting these five airports. So it, was just, it just so happened that for this uh, 10,000 flights, on this day, these were the airports that, were, that had the most delay. So we said, um, can you give me a new schedule solution that, reduce the, that reduces the delays at New York, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego? So what we see here is that compared to the baseline, right? compared to the baseline maggot, which doesn't try to protect any of your desired protected airports, um, if you do the naive approach of just setting penalties at the target airport, you actually get a really nice reduction, right? You actually do get a reduction, but in exchange, you get really, really uh, spiky delays at your other airports, right? So this is a conserved system, as I said, right? So the delays have to go somewhere, right? So in this schedule proposed by the RMAGIP, the delays going to the other non-targeted airports, the non-protected airports, um, were high, and they're high in a really, really bad manner. They're high in sort of a a, a, a sudden manner, so, right? So you're doing fine, you're doing fine, and then all of a sudden your delays spike up at your non-protected airports. Um, although you could argue that's a really nice reduction at the at the protected airports, right? Um, but what 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 actually ended up being a better solution operationally is this augmented maggot, which is we see that the reduction is a little lower, right? So it's a 13% reduction instead of an 18% reduction, but in exchange, because your reference plan also accounted for this reduced total variation, you result in a smoother delay solution overall. So the airports that weren't protected doesn't see as drastic. These y-axis are the same, so you can compare the two plots directly. But um, you don't see as dramatic of an increase in the delays by using this um, uh, uh, aug uh, by using this augmented maggot plan. Um, and then I think I'm gonna oh, sorry. And of course, the the other thing that airlines are interested in is like, great, you can give me the schedule. But if the schedule, if this new schedule tells me I have to reschedule 50% of my flights, I'm not going to, I'm not going to implement this, right? It's too hard for me to implement. So we double checked that, that with this, so the, the, um, the schedule changes for the augmented maggot, it only changed the schedule for about 11% of, uh, of, of uh, the, of the American airline flights in this particular scenario. So we, we, we didn't, Throw out their schedule completely, right? We wanted to make sure that our hierarchical control doesn't tell you to do something, you know, uh, uh, that that would have other costs associated, right? Um, I think I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, but basically, there's you can also like tweak how much or how little you actually care about tracking the plan. So we we looked at some sensitivities on that, um, but I want what I wanted to end this with is. Um, is this, this final idea here that we're currently working on. So we have this model for how we should reschedule and deal with disruptions, but how do airlines actually implement, right? So if I give you a solution that is what, what, what we call system optimal, sure, it reduces the delays. Let's say it minimizes the delays that you and I see, right? You see that plane was delayed 10 minutes from its scheduled, but to, to let's say Delta Airlines, a flight delay, two flights delay 10 minutes are not worth the same, right? Maybe one flight has a lot of connecting passengers. Maybe it has a lot of gold medallion passengers, right? 10 minutes on one flight could be a lot more costly than 10 minutes on another flight. And this valuation, right? This, this new sub F, this valuation is not going to be public information, right? Delta is not going to say, this, era, this flight I care a lot more about because XYZ business sensitive trends, right? So the, the gist of this work is coming up with a mechanism 
that has a couple of guarantees. And what are the guarantees? I'll just, uh, yeah, so, the, ooh, so these are the three guarantees that we really wanted to have in this mechanism. So first of all, that you're incentivized to participate, that participating in this mechanism, your private delays, so the delays Delta experiences, it will never be. So you can, you can only be better off participating, right? That's one, uh, 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 that, uh, that, that's one property we wanted. The second is, let's say you lie about how high or low priority uh, your, your flights are. We want to make sure you can't game the system by lying, right? And then finally, uh, we want to make sure that to, to us, the public, which still sees the 10 minutes of delay, um, any sort of solution that protects the private delays may end up really increasing the public delays, right? So we wanted to make sure that the public delay increases balance in terms of how uh, So out of time, I'm going to save the last couple of minutes for questions. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks again for spending your Friday afternoons here. Um, and I'm happy to take and answer any questions. Thank you. Next, be happy to stay and answer questions. And also if people are online and they have questions, yes. I think, um, yeah. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. So does this give the airlines some like freedom in what they choose to do? Like, are, do they have some variables or is the FAA or whatever central body telling them uh, everything in this case? So at the end of the day, airlines can always decide to cancel a flight and prioritize another flight, right? And they might do that because the private valuation for one flight was lower or higher. Right. So they do have a lot of flexibility in the system, but that makes collaboration difficult, right? Especially in this partial information. So their wiggle room is like, they, it's not like they have an assignment of delay minutes they have to work with. It's more, they, no. they just have a, a schedule and they can take it or they can cancel. They, 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 they're they given a reduced capacity and they're basically, you know, they're basically told to, uh, you know, what flights would you like to delay? What flights would you like to cancel? They they provide that list. So there's a whole, it's actually, it's literally called collaborative decision making. And there's like steps of how, how, um, how airlines go through that process. Thank you. Yeah. My question is more technical. It's that uh, how is the prediction model is incorporated into the control? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in terms of, So right now, when I run this, it's actually, so right now it's not incorporated at all. So right now, it, the only prediction is I, I, I know what schedule I'm gonna run for the next 24 hours because I run this multi-airport ground holding call, right? But in actuality, there's a lot of randomness, right? There's, there's um, unknown capacities, unknown, um, unknown factors that influence the capacities, right? So, you can't, so there is something called the SMAGIP, which is the stochastic multi airport ground holding problem. And the, stoch the, 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 the SMAGIP requires an input into it, which are capacity scenarios, right? Now you can imagine that total delay, uh, that DOT prediction coming in as a, as a uh, set of scenarios of how the day will evolve, right? So we haven't implemented the SMAGIP here. So the prediction part is currently unlinked from from this control. So, so what is the uh, system dynamics we are you currently using for control? So right now, the, uh, there, so there, there are models where you can actually specify a system dynamic. So for example, there's a couple of Markov jump linear type representations where you say that the, the delays evolve in some, you know, X of T plus one is equal to A of X of T. And then that A matrix also changes um, the, the, uh, based on some transition probabilities. For us, the system dynamics is really just what are the differences between the current allotted demand for each hour, which is given to you by this magnet, right? Um, and what are the current capacities, which is either deterministic, which is what we do right now, or stochastic, which would come in as, a, as, uh, as part of the DRT predictions, let's say. Uh, one of the constraints in the reference planning uh, was the minimum flight time, right? Yeah, yeah. So is that like a universal floor or is that case by case thing or how does that work? 
Oh, so yeah. So like, for example, this L of F will be different if it's Detroit to Boston versus Detroit to San Francisco, right? It's just like, what's the block time for your flight? And, and you essentially, you can't show up in Boston earlier than that block time, right? Because you had to fly there. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the results for your prediction, um, it looked like in, there's like a, a period in the midday where uh, the accuracy was always just lower. Uh, so yeah, that's a that's a great observation. It's not midday actually. These are these are GMT hours. So this is somewhere like five or six a.m. on the East Coast. So it's actually the beginning of the operational day in the U.S. So this this is because there's a whole ton of zeros in my inputs here, right? It's the beginning of the day. Usually there's not a lot of delays, right? So there, it's it's a very zero inflated system right around this time. That's what we suspect is causing this uh, 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 dip, right? Um, so we tried some things to fix it. Like we, we said, when it's in this regime here, we actually try to uh, 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 overinflate errors. And here we underinflated errors, right? Depending on how, uh, how big or small the delays are. Um, but yeah, so that's what we suspect is causing this issue here. Because it does map to the right, like East Coast 5 to 6 AM start of, start of uh, airline money in this game. Yeah. Um, question about the identified so do you identify the disruption on behind the thing or you're not actually yeah so that's a great question so basically you're saying like so let's say we see this trajectory you say that's a thunderstorm or like that's a yeah that's a hurricane right so we so we don't like we don't make uh, so we try to do this identification agnostic of whatever factors are happening. We try to do it just based off of the the the, the performance measures that we that we uh, observe. Yeah. But we did so given um, given these DRTs, we did look at if I knew historically this chunk was hurricanes, what kind of DRTs appeared during the hurricane times, and what kind of DRTs appeared during the thunderstorm times, right? So in the intro, you mentioned military flights. Does that play into um, any of this at all, or is it like a separate? Yeah, so in terms of the flights, uh, that's obviously proprietary information that we don't know. But here's, so generally, the biggest part that the military plays in this is they sometimes close down airspace, right? When they need to do ex when they do exercises, when they have other, um, I don't know, like live fire drills. But whatever the need is, they close down the airspace, right? So that would that would show up. Scoop forward a little bit here. That would show up as that might show up as like an airspace flow program, right? Where it's an airspace flow program with a rate of zero, so zero aircraft per hour can flow into this airspace, right? So that that can show up. There's there's a there's a version of the MAGIP called the air traffic flow management problem, which is the MAGIP plus in route sector capacities. And in there, if you have a sector that's affected by military operations, you would have a capacity of zero in that sector, right? And as you might imagine, the ATFMP is much harder to solve computationally than the MAGIT because now you have all these sector constraints uh, for your capacities as well. Uh, oh, I was about to ask if there are any questions from uh, the Zoom. Let's make sure that uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, those that are on the Zoom, please feel free to unmute and ask. Otherwise, maybe we can take a last question. Yeah. Um, so, what do you envision as like the most effective way to apply this? Like, to what scale? Like, would it be like every airline or every network of airports kind of gets their own version of this, or like an even bigger universal system that is trying to opt like predict and optimize this? Um, like, what yeah, kind of that's for scale strategy. Do you think would work the best, or should be applied? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's what kind of led us to this last piece of work, which I had literally like no time because <laughs> I'm horrible at timing. But this is what kind of led to this last piece, right? Is trying to think about how we can get airlines to actually agree on executing one of these schedules, right? Um, I, I generally like to look at things at the level of an entire airspace and not at like a sector level or like the level of 
one airline's network. Of course, Delta would only be interested in its own airline network, right? American has its own interests and so on, um, which of course means you have to deviate from you know, your optimal kind of, if everyone shared every information solution. Um, but the model that we were thinking of is maybe the FAA or maybe a third party nonprofit like, like, like the MITRE Corporation, which is where I had done uh, work for the last year, maybe they could act as sort of the central agent in terms of, you know, collecting and assigning new rates, new departure times, and so on, right? So that is sort of level that I'm thinking of. Um, there's also a lot of really great work out there that looks at, like, the level of individual routes or individual route networks. So there's also definitely, like, there's, there's been work kind of up and down this Okay. Um, well, there are no other questions. I think it's about time to resume to close this seminar. Next time, thank everyone again, Professor Maxley, for this great presentation. Welcome to our seminar sessions and see you next Friday. I wasn't sure how many people would show up. Oh, no worries. <laughs> that could be permissive. Is it close to silence? Of course. Well, no, oh, there are so many. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, thank y'all for, again, spending your Fridays here. <laughs> that is